same time, these people were getting clean, these people who had families, they were starting to see reconciliation between uh, drug addicts and their families. They started to come, and then eventually there started to be church growth, and people started to come because they knew that this was a church that cared about people who were hurting and lost in their community. So even though they had this kind of turmoil of like, people are leaving, what are we going to do? Can we even afford to do this ministry now? To a growth. And when I look at that story, it really boils down to that it was people who were filled with the Holy Spirit, with the knowledge of the Lord, who really wanted to make a difference in people's lives. And that's what the empowered church looks like. You know, when we think about the modern church, the issue with the modern church is that it's tame. The issue with the modern church is that it's tame. And A.W. Tozer, in a lot of his writings on the Holy Spirit, writes that the Holy Spirit can leave a church and 98% of the congregants would continue to live without even knowing it. And he wrote that back in like the 50s and 60s. And it's interesting because even when we look at the churches today and some of the statistics in the churches in America, we're seeing the same trend. And a lot of times it's that the church is tame. The church is tame. And one of the things about the empowering of the Holy Spirit is that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we're able to do great things. Sometimes we're able to go and take risks and do things that's really going to bring about the kingdom. You know, a lot of times when I think about the early church and when I read through the book of Acts, a lot of the things in the book of Acts is that church was not tame, but that was a church that was risky. They were going around and proclaiming the name of Jesus in a polytheist culture. They were claiming they were Romans had a bunch of different gods, and they were saying there is only one true God, and his name is Jesus Christ. You also see from the Jewish perspective that they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God or Jesus the Messiah, and yet they continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And we see apostles got killed, apostles got thrown in prison, apostles got beaten up, and every time when all that stuff happened, the name of Jesus continued to be glorified, and the Holy Spirit continued to move through them and to do great things. The other issue when it comes to the empowering church is that when we think about the Holy Spirit and in empowering people, a lot of people believe that when the Holy Spirit comes a, come upon us, an indicator that the Holy Spirit is in our lives is because of the certain great emotions that we may feel. You know, we may have joy, we may have tears, there may be clapping, there may be shouts of hallelujah, and we can kind of say, well, that is an indicator of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But the reality is, is those are not indicators, but symptoms. I believe that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that there is great joy, there is great excitement, there is great love, there's a lot of wonderful things that can happen in our lives. But I believe that those are symptoms of something much deeper that is happening when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Um, about a couple weeks ago, I was at the hospital, and I was actually, um, I was visiting Bob when he was in the hospital, and when I got there, uh, the uh, staff uh, alerted me that I needed to put a mask on because within the last couple of weeks, they, the ER has been packed due to flu outbreak. So I had a mask. I think I actually had two masks on my face. I think I grabbed the next one. I had two masks on my face. And I'm there, and I'm with Bob and Terry and Sylvia, and we're just talking with them, seeing how I was doing, praying over them, and then also escorting him to his room. And, and that's a whole adventure uh, for another day of all that stuff that transpired. But I remember that when I was leaving, when I was leaving, I kept coughing. And I was driving home and I just kept having this cough. And I'm starting to think, am I sick? Did I get the flu? And it was aggravated, but it turned out I was fine. But there was something in my head that I was thinking that I was sick because I was told, there's the flu everywhere and I'm hitting every dispenser, making sure my hands are sanitized. I was being very OCD about it because I was worried about the symptoms of getting the flu, even though it wasn't true, it was a false. Uh, it was a false symptom that I was experiencing. When we think about the Holy Spirit, if there's one person who's an expert on the Holy Spirit, that would be Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was a minister in the 1732, where the Great Awakening happened, and in the Great Awakening, that's when the Holy Spirit began to pour out in this country, and a lot of people in this country began to hear the message of Jesus Christ and begin and begin to be saved. 
And in one of his writings, he began to talk about how the empowering, the empowering church or the empowered people of the Holy Spirit is not based off emotional, emotionalism, but it's based off these five things. And we're going to go ahead and look at these five steps. So the first thing that Jonathan Edwards uh, says is he says that the empowered people, the empowered people or the empowered church are people who exalt Jesus Christ. They are people who exalt Jesus Christ. And when we look at John's gospel, John 15, 26, it says, When the advocate comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Jesus is telling his apostles that when I leave, when I go back to heaven, when I go back to be with the Father, that the Holy Spirit will come and he will testify about the things that I did. He will testify about me. So one of the marks of being, of being empowered and empowered churches, are we exalting Jesus Christ? Are we testifying about Jesus Christ? Even in John 16, 14, it says, He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. And again, Jesus talked about how the Father is glorifying the Son, but he's going to make that known to you. I mean, the disciples knew that Jesus was the Son of God. And when the Holy Spirit came upon Pentecost that we read in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 8, we really see that, you know, the Spirit was really moving and everyone was proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and exalted Jesus Christ. You know, when I think about that word exalt, the word exalt, it means basically to hold something in high honor or the high esteem. So a lot of times when we think about that word exalt, especially in the biblical terms, usually a general uh, of an army would be someone who is exalted. And when we think about that, about a general, an exalted, an esteemed general, if it's this esteemed person, this esteemed general was to say, hey, I need you to do this as we prepare for war. I need you this to go into the battle. The soldiers will do it, not because of the ranking officer, but if he's such exalted, they do it because of their great love for this general. In the same way, if the church says that we have a great love of Jesus Christ, if we have a great love of him, then basically that means that we should be exalting Jesus Christ. That's what he told us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. To exalt Jesus Christ means that we are his witnesses to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ wherever we go. So when we think about this as far as exalting Jesus Christ, we do that through the proclamation of the gospel. We do that through worship. We do that through teaching. And we do that through direction. And a lot of times, to exalt the Lord means that we have to turn our hearts towards Him. Meaning that everything we do, everything we do in our life has to reflect Jesus Christ if we exalt Him as Lord and Savior. The next thing that we see Jonathan Edwards talks about is he says that empowered people attacked Satan's interest. When we look at the scriptures, we can look at John 16, 8, that says, When he comes... He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. To be an empowered church, we attack the interest of the enemy. And one of the great stories about this is in Matthew 16, 22 through 24. And if you have that, go ahead and turn there right now. Matthew 16, uh, 22 through 24. Matthew 16, 22 to 24, it says, all right, there you go. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You know, here Jesus is telling his disciples that he is going to die. This is, the, I think, believe the first time he predicts his death. And Peter says, Lord, that's never going to happen to you. Don't even talk like that. And Jesus had to say, get behind me, Satan. 
Not because Peter was the devil, not because Peter was demon-possessed, but because Peter was speaking out of pure emotions. He was speaking out of human terms, where Jesus was speaking out of godly terms. This is what the Father wants for me to do, because you don't understand the power that I'm going to do. You don't understand, Peter, the sacrifice that I must make to redeem all of humanity back to God. So we see that it's an attack of the interest. So when we of the devil's interest, so empowered people can distinguish what is man's interest and what is God's interest. And it goes back to the church we just talked about in North Carolina. You know, man's interest was like, well, we don't want these people here. They're going to steal stuff. They're going to destroy our church. We don't want that. But God's interest was, we want people to be healed. We want people to no longer have to struggle with the, being bondage to the chains of addiction. And we want these people to be healed in the power of Jesus Christ. And that was the distinguishing marks of the early church. The third thing is, is that they exalted the holy scriptures. In John 14, 26, it says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. We see later in John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know the master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. And that's one of the things about the Holy Spirit is that it recalls what Jesus had said to the disciples and teach them, to re and basically to teach others about it. And we have to remember that the disciples didn't have Bibles. All the disciples had were the Old Testament. They didn't have anything written down uh, from what Jesus said until a lot later, after the day of Pentecost. So the fact that here's these prophets, these uh, apostles who are going around and proclaiming the name of Jesus, uh, that is something very spectacular. And especially if the scripture is our rule of faith and it guides us in how we should live, act, and even how we can discern for wisdom during times of doubt. And I know there have been times where like, sometimes I could be ministering to someone and witnessing to someone and they could ask me a question and instantly the scripture will pop into my head. I go, well, hey, it says this. And I can just automatically just say it out. And sometimes I don't even know the reference. Sometimes I know, I know it's there and I have to actually look up the reference a second time to make sure that it's actually scripture and not just spoken out of just, you know, improv. But we see that when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're able to exalt the Holy Scriptures. It's something that should be spoken out and lived out in praise and in mission. Because the early church didn't just proclaim the Scriptures, they lived by the Scriptures. The fourth point is that they lift up sound doctrine. And again, that word doctrine is teaching, is what that word is. And we look at a John 14, 17 that says, The Spirit of Truth... The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Now, last week when we were looking at the culture of the church, one of the things we said is that there's a lot of content out there that gets thrown in our face. A lot of news stories, a lot of stuff wherever we go. There's just a lot of information coming towards us, thrown in our face. And sometimes some of it may look good, but the question is, is, is it sound? Is it true? Is it sound? Is there a way to determine? And basically the thing is, is, is there a way to determine what is sound doctrine and what is not? Especially with all the content that is thrown at us. You know, and a lot of times when I think about this idea of sound doctrine, and I'm going to use food as an illustration because this was the first thing that came to my mind and I was trying to figure it out. But how many of you, if you eat a chicken sandwich, one chicken sandwich fills you up? All right, okay, so, so you know, one chicken sandwich fills you up because it's fulfilling. Now, how many Oreos can you eat in one sitting? Or have you even tried to eat how many Oreos you can eat in one sitting? I know I can devour an entire box, but it takes me one chicken sandwich to fill me up. Why is that? Because the chicken sandwich is more filling. There's more nutrients. It's, it's healthier for you. Where Oreos is basically just sugar. And you just keep going and your body's always hungry and craving it because it wants more nutrients to make sure that your, your health is balanced. So sometimes it's important to eat the chicken sandwich then eat a box of Oreos. It's more satisfying for you. So in the same way, how do we know if, there's sound, if something is true, if something is sound? 
well, I can go and I can listen to people, I can tell the other people, and they can say, well, this is what is true because I said so, or this is my opinion, or whatever else. But the fact of the matter is, is the simple answer, and the most complex answer, is how we know sound teaching is true, is we have to exalt the Holy Scriptures. If we truly know what the Scripture says, if we truly are in the Word of God, then we will always know what sound doctrine is because we have a good understanding of God's Holy Word. And then the last thing, the next, the last distinguishing marks of empowered people is to promote love to man and to God. Promote love to man and to God. And we look to Matthew uh, 22, 37 to 39. It says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. When I think about that word promote, promote is to hype. Promote is to hype. If you are promoting something, you know, you want to build it up, you want to make sure it's good, and especially a lot of times, like, if I see commercials and there's a sale, we're going to be like a big sale at, like, Nissan or Ford, you know, they're really hyping stuff up. Hey, come on out. There's this big sales event. There's this big holiday, and, you, and you're like, here's this brand new car. You're going to pay this much money because it's our biggest sale, our label <coughs> sale, and they hype up, or especially... Of those local business owners where they're on there and it's those commercials where they're screaming and yelling and, and it's just like, whoa, they're really trying to get you to go to their store to buy a car because they're hyping it up, they're promoting it. And I think that's the same thing when we think about promote love to man and to God. That's something that has to be done boldly. That's something that has to be done courageously, something that has to be done faithfully, something that has to be risked because think about it, love is a risk. Love is a risk. I mean, you think about it. Like, think about it. Like, if you love someone, you can love someone with a wall up, or you let down your walls, you're vulnerable with that person so that you can love them. So love is a risk. And sometimes that promoting love to man, and especially promoting love to God, sometimes that's beyond our capacity. Because if I try to love people based on my own strength or my own feelings, I know that eventually I'm going to start throwing walls up. There's going to be times where I'm going to choose who I love and who I don't love. But then I think about what did Jesus do? We know Jesus loved the Father. We know Jesus loved his disciples, even Peter, who he had to say, get behind me, Satan. He had to rebuke. But Peter also, or sorry, Jesus also loved the Pharisees. Because what was Jesus? Jesus had come to save, to redeem the lost sheep of Israel. That was the Pharisees, the same people who crucified him. Jesus loved Judas and washed his feet and broke bread with him, even though he knew that Judas was going to betray him. But Jesus loved him anyway. And that's the thing about the hype and the bold and how love is taking a risk because we get that through the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, I'm able to love more boldly. I'm able to love more risk. I'm able to love and take risks. I'm able to meet people who may, who I may not mesh with, people who I may feel uncomfortable with and love them right where they are so that the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Jesus Christ can flow through me to empower another person, to break the chains in their life. And that is what unconditional love is. And that's the thing about unconditional love. It works both ways. We receive love if we don't deserve it. And we're able to give love even when we don't feel like it. And that can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you, if I was to pour water into this glass of rocks with dirt and moss on it. How many of you would drink from this? No one probably. I don't see any hands raised. Let me ask you a question. If you were at a restaurant, you wanted the water and the waiter puts this on your table and gives you some water and asks you to fill it up, would you put water in this glass? No, you'd probably drink it right from the bottle or I guess if there's a, a pitcher, you'd probably drink it right from the pitcher. Or you ask for a new glass and ask why there are rocks in here. See, the same thing is about with the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit will not pour itself into his people if they're stuffed in here. What are these rocks? You know, they're bitterness. It's anger. It's a lot of things. And actually, D. Uh, D.L. Moody writes this. He writes, I firmly believe that the moment our hearts are empty of selfishness and ambition and self-seeking and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will come and fill every corner of our hearts. But if we are full of pride and conceit, ambition and self-seeking pleasures in the world, there is no room for the Spirit of God. I also believe that many a man is praying for God to fill him when he is full already with something else. Before we pray that God would fill us, I believe we ought to pray that he would empty us. That we're, there will be an emptying before there can be a filling. And when the heart is turned upside down and everything that is contrary to God is turned out, then the Spirit will come. You know, when I think about the Holy Spirit, I think about what it means to be empowered people of the Holy Spirit. I totally believe everything that D.L. Moody says. I believe everything that the Word says. I even am reminded of a, a parable. I was just thinking about this uh, this morning, that there's a parable where Jesus is telling the disciples about a man who had a demon, and that the demon was driven out. But there was nothing put back into place in the man's heart, so the demon came back with three of its friends and was able to possess the same person. I think a lot of times it's hard for us to really understand how we can be empowered people when some of us carry a lot of bitterness in our lives. We carry a lot of hurt, and a lot of that hurt turns into anger, turns into pride, turns into a lot of things. And when we have all those things within our hearts, it's hard for the Spirit to pour itself in there when there's too much stuff in our hearts. So my prayer for us today, my prayer for the churches in all of America and all the world today has been that we become empowered churches. <coughs> churches filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to promote hope, to promote love, to promote faithfulness, to promote things to not only one another in unity, but to those in our community who need the love of God. Maybe there's some of us here today who has something heavy on our hearts. Maybe some of us have some things that haven't been reconciled yet and has left a bitter taste in your heart and you need that to be reconciled today so that the Spirit can come and fill us up. So my prayer as we sing our final song, you know, these altars are open for any reason, whatever you want to pray for, whether it's for healing, whether it's for wisdom, guidance. But maybe some of us here today realize that, you know, I have a lot of stuff in here. And really, I just need to be able to turn that cup over and empty all that stuff out so that the Holy Spirit can pour itself into me. And think about it, what that would do to you as a person. Think about what that would do to you if your whole family did that. Think about it, what it would do if the entire church did that. We would be able to do some of the great and amazing things that we read in the book of Acts, some of the things where people are finding out the true God of Jesus Christ and providing hope. That's my prayer for us today. That's my prayer over my own life. So let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the many blessings you have given us, Lord. And God, right now, you know, we, we've already mentioned that there's just been a lot of stuff going on this week, and there's a lot of people who may have a lot of stuff in their hearts, a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness, a lot of something that is not from you. And whatever that thing that is in our hearts that is not from you, that is preventing us to receive the filling up of the Holy Spirit, Lord, God, right now I just pray that we're just able to empty those to you. If we're able to lay these down here at the altars, lay these down so that we can be filled with your Holy Spirit, Lord. And God, I especially pray that for all the people who we've lifted up in prayer, God, Lord, we just especially pray for all the needs in our lives, Lord. God, we just ask, Holy Spirit, come. Increase the capacity for the Holy Spirit to dwell within me, to dwell within our congregation, to dwell within our church, Lord, so that we can be the empowered church that you have envisioned 
for each and every one of us, what you have envisioned and have showed in your word, Lord. It's in all these things we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, will you please stand as we sing our benediction song? And again, these altars are open.